I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Jewett from Princess Margaret Hospital, University Health Network, Hello. Uh, Chair of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. And this is Dr. Arkady Mandel. He's our Chief Scientific Officer leading the uh, anti-cancer technology. Okay. Corporate overview. Uh, Theralase, public company, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange as TLT. We trade over the counter in the US as TLTFF. Our primary focus is development and commercialization of medical laser technology. What we want to do with our technology, our mandate is to build technology which heals patients safer, faster, and more effectively than any of our competitors. We have two divisions. We have a therapeutic laser technology division, or TLT division. This is our technology which is used to heal tissue. So this is cold laser light technology, penetrates up to four inches into tissue, and activates certain chromophores, or cytochromes in tissue, to regenerate tissue at the source of injury. You can use it to eliminate pain, reduce inflammation, accelerate tissue healing, we have a legacy business, the TLC 900 to TLC 1000 series, generates about one and a half million dollars a year in revenue. And we use this to treat a wide range of nerve, muscle, and joint conditions. This is a technology we sell to chiropractors, physical therapists, athletic therapists, massage therapists, medical doctors, podiatrists, veterinarians, etc. We have a brand new series, the TLC 2000 which is a patented biofeedback technology with cell sensing technology, meaning that you can locate injured tissue to a fraction to an accuracy of a millimeter and deliver an exact dose of energy. Why this is important is that light is a drug. So each wavelength of light has a specific effect on tissue. So just like if you have a headache and you take two aspirins, it resolves your headache. If you take a tenth of an aspirin, it has no effect. If you take 200 aspirins, I have to drive you to the emergency ward, okay? So with light, you want to deliver an exact dose of energy to that damaged tissue. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we all come in many variations of skin coloration, subcutaneous fat, not that anybody has any subcutaneous fat, muscle, oxygen perfusion, water hydration. This affects the amount of light that actually reaches tissue by up to 10,000 times. So it's like delivering a dose of light where you don't know what you're getting. Whether you're getting a minimal dose, an effective dose, an overdose, you have no idea. What this technology does is it takes the guesswork out of that and it delivers an exact dose of energy to tissue based on a patient's physical characteristics. We're awaiting Health Canada approval, so we'll be launching it in Canada in fourth quarter 2015 and into the U.S. and Europe in first quarter 2016. We're, of course, beholden to the regulators, so we have to wait for their approval. Our second division is our Photodynamic Therapy Division, or PDT Division, or Anti-Cancer Division. Here we've in-licensed photodynamic compounds, which have an affinity to localize into cancer cells. They're benign until light activated. Once light activated, they're able to destroy cancer and or bacteria. We're using this technology uh, primarily for our oncology, and our lead cancer is non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Okay. So talking about the TLT division, um, we have FDA, Health Canada, and CE approval for chronic knee pain. Generate about one and a half million dollars last year. We're tracking about two million dollars this year. This is without the launch of our TLC 2000 technology. The disconnect in the market, if you look at the U.S. pain market, is about $100 billion a year and growing rapidly with the aging population. According to the U.S. Uh, stats, half of that population, or 42%, are still in significant pain even after they use pharmaceutical drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs also have a lot of side effects, oxycodone, oxycontin. There's a lot of um, risk of addiction with these type of opioids. 46% still are in significant pain post-surgery. In the U.S., they have failed carpal tunnel surgery, failed low back surgery. So not that pharmaceutical drugs and surgery don't have an application. Therapeutic lasers can offset some of that demand with none of the side effects of some of these other choices. So the opportunity is to launch our next generation TLC 2000 in Canada in fourth quarter of this year. 
U.S. and Europe in first quarter 2016. We feel that through this and through a recurring revenue model, we can drive our sales from the millions of dollars into the tens of millions of dollars. So here's the TLC 2000. It's actually outside on the table outside, so you can have a look at it after this meeting. This is a technology, patented technology, which is able to sense exactly where injured tissue is in the body and deliver that exact dose of energy to heal it. So it's called cell sensing technology. Patented in Canada, the US, and most of the major economies of Europe. The unique part of this technology, it has the high rep repeatability and reproducibility in order to go mainstream medicine. This technology has not gone mainstream simply because of the variation in the light doses received at tissue depth. If you look at the clinical studies, some say it works really well, some say it works okay, some says it doesn't work at all. But with this technology being able to deliver an exact dose of, of light to tissue, we feel that it'll meet the high standards of the medical industry and also for the insurance industry in order to go mainstream. That's how we're going to get to the much higher uh, revenue numbers. It's able to displace competitive technologies being a more scientific and clinically proven technology. There's a very attractive return on investment with the technology, delivering 1,300 to 3,000% return. I'll get into the numbers where that comes from. We also feel that this technology will be able to uh, achieve a unique CPT code because of the biofeedback technology, allowing it to have a virtual monopoly in the U.S. market. So here's the, we're moving from a capital equipment model to a recurring revenue model. In our current technology, we sell a laser system to a practitioner. It's very similar to if I sell you a car. Once you have a car, you don't need another car. We want to move to a recurring revenue model. You want to move to more of the razor blade model. So the pr practitioner's incentive is very high. With 7 to 15 treatments per month at $50 per treatment, they can generate enough revenue to pay for the lease of a technology which leases between $330 to $740 per month. The clinics generate, on average, greater than $10,000 per month with our technology. We have some practitioners that will generate $35,000 a month with our technology. So to generate the ten grand, you need 20 patients, uh, or sorry, 10 patients a day, 20 working days a month, $50 of treatment. It's around $10,000. So with it, they generate a very high return, 1350 to 3,000% return on investment. On our side of the equation, our business model is to move them to a recurring revenue model. Under this model, we have elected to partner with the largest leasing company in Canada, and we sell the technology between the $17,000 and $37,000 range, on average around $25,000. So we charge between $330 to $740 per month, on average about $500 a month. So our objective is to generate $500 per month per laser ad infinitum, okay? How we do that is we sign them up on the paperwork for the leasing company, and the leasing company pays us day one. So the day that we deliver the product, we generate uh, $25,000 in revenue. The lease company owns the device for five years, and at the end of that term, they sell it back to us, at 2% of the original purchase price or sale price, so a $25,000 product at around $500. Now we own that. At that point, we can now work with the practitioner on a recurring revenue model. So the lease includes the product, the training, the warranty for five years, plus all the marketing support. So it's very similar to the car model. If I sold you a car, okay, and I supplied all the oil changes, the gas, the brakes, the tires, and I showed you how to drive the car, and I also sent you a list every morning of people who wanted to ride with you in the car and pay for it. So it's a very attractive model for practitioners, especially when they're making a 2,000% return on investment. At the end of the five years, the practitioner has four options. They can return the equipment to Theralase and discontinue its use. We think that'll be a small percentage. They can pay the 10% residual. So we bought the device for $500 from the lease company. They pay us $2,500. And they get to keep the technology, but we discontinue all the support, the service, and the marketing. 
or they can continue to pay half their lease rate, $165 to $370 per month, and we maintain their warranty and marketing coverage. We think this will be a high percentage of the practitioners out there. Or they can elect to purchase our latest 2020 technology and recommence the lease process and start it all over again. We think that this will be a very high percentage. So this is very much the AT&T model, the Bell model, the TELUS model. When you have a cell phone and it comes at the end of the lease, they say, well, here's a new version. Let's trade you up and get you to the next level. So if you look at the U.S. market, there's 1.3 million practitioners that can buy our device. In Canada, there's 130,000. We only have to sell 200 units at 25 grand to make $5 million in revenue. We only have to sell 400 units to make 10 million in revenue. So there's certainly a, a large opportunity for Theralase moving forward with this technology. So moving on to our anti-cancer technology, we have patented anti-cancer drugs known as photodynamic compounds or PDCs able to localize inside cancer cells and then they're benign until light activated. Once light activated, they destroy, they produce what's called reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and they can destroy certain organelles, forcing the cell through natural cell death, or what's called apoptosis. They can also be used as a diagnostic. They fluoresce under certain wavelengths of light, and you can use them to detect certain cancer cells and also micrometastases, too small to be seen by the human eye. They have generated an immune response we have done a subcutaneous mouse model where we injected 350,000 cancer cells. We allowed the tumor to grow to 5 millimeters in size. We did an intertumor injection of our compound, allowed four hours for it to localize, light activated it, and we showed complete destruction of the cancer. We followed the mouse for 18 to 20 months, which is the life of the mouse, and there was no cancer, no scarring, no recurrence. So the ability to destroy just the cancer without affecting healthy tissue. But we wanted to see the memory or the immune-mediated response, so we injected that mouse, poor mouse, um, up to three times with the cancer cells again, 350,000 cells uh, again. And what we found is that there was no uh, regrowth of the cancer. Without any further intervention on our part, we found that the tumor was rejected. We feel that there was a, an immune-modulated effect in that the killer T cells recognized those cancer cells and could now hunt them down and destroy them systemically. The research is being performed at one of the top five cancer institutes in the world, Princess Margaret Cancer Center, University Health Network. What we've seen is a very high cell kill, 100% cell kill at very low concentrations, less than 0.8 micromolar. If you can imagine a glass of water, eight ounce glass of water and dropping a grain of salt in it, that's the concentrations you're looking at. So it's a very potent photosensitizer. We've compared ourselves to two FDA-approved drugs. We're 600,000 times more effective than amino lipidolytic acid, 200 times more effective than photofrin. We're able to treat solid core hypoxic tumors, such as breast, prostate, lung, and bladder through what's called a type 1 and type 2 activation, which means that you don't have to have oxygen present in order to have a destruction of these tumors. We've shown almost zero toxicity at higher concentrations, greater than 100 micromolar, with no side effects. Our lead cancer, or what we're going after uh, in fourth quarter of this year, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, we've shown an ultra-low toxicity with a negligible entry of our drug into the bloodstream or systemic uh, ingress. It also has an excellent specificity and selectivity of the drug through what's called the transfer and receptor, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And it also um, has a water-soluble ability in the sense that uh, it makes it very easy for a catheter to be injected into the bladder uh, through an intervesical installation. Our drugs are also known as black bodies, meaning that they can be activated from ultraviolet through to near-infrared. So we can activate them all the way from 100 microns into tissue up to 4 inches into tissue. With bladder cancer, it starts from the inside of the organ and grows out. So we can make it very patient-specific on the depth of penetration or the activation of the uh, drug. And these uh, photodynamic compounds are held under patents and uh, international patent applications. 
So here it's just showing the safety and the efficacy. So on the left-hand side, we've taken human bladder cancer cells, and we've used various concentrations of our drug, anywhere from decimal 00125 millimolar to decimal 04. It doesn't mean a lot, but basically it means that we can use various concentrations of the drug. And here, without light activation, there's no impact, right? So a very safe and tolerable procedure. Once you light activate it, you see almost 100% kill across the board at, again, various concentrations. So the takeaway here is we can make it very patient-specific. We can use, depending on the depth of the disease, we can use various concentrations of the drug, we can use various concentrations of the light, and we can use different colors of the light to activate it, again, from 100 microns up to 4 inches into tissue. This is showing uh, the versatility of the drugs. Again, we're looking at three different cell lines here. Mouse colon cancer, a carcinoma. A human brain cancer, a glioblastoma. And a rat brain cancer, a glioma. Again, very high safety and tolerability profile on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you're seeing virtually 100% kill. The dark blue bars are the Theralase drug. 100% kill across the board at very, very low concentrations. Here you're looking at decimal 00016 millimolar. You're in the nanomolar concentrations of this drug. So again, a very, very potent photosensitizer. We've compared it to amino levulinic acid, ALA, and also to photofrin, and you can see the little yellow bars here is amino levulinic acid. So clearly at these concentrations, ALA doesn't hold up to uh, the photodynamic compound that we have. You can see photofrin at lower concentrations loses its efficacy. The Theralase drug maintains its efficacy even at these low concentrations. So it's quite a remarkable drug. Here's the mechanism of action. Uh, transferrin is a glycoprotein. It's what's used to trans, uh, transport iron throughout your body to every cell in your body. What happens with cancer cells is because of their high mitotic rate, they have a high de demand for iron. So they need a lot of iron. So the literature uh, supports that cancer cells have up to 10 times the number of transferrin receptor sites that normal cells have. So what we do is we use that mechanism to drive our drug across the cellular membrane of the cancer cell. Because iron is a transitional eight metal, our drugs are ruthenium and osmium based, which are also transitional eight metals. So we can remove iron from the glycoprotein transferrin, insert um, ruthenium and osmium drugs, and use those to transport our drug across the cellular membrane through these transferrin receptor sites. Once inside the cell, they localize onto the mitochondria or the endoplasmic reticulum. They're benign until light activated. Once light activated, they produce reactive oxygen species. They oxidize the cell and they force it through apoptosis. So here you can see different staining. Here we're showing DAPI staining, which stains the nucleus. So you can see that our drug, which is staining red, is not localizing inside the nucleus, but it is localizing in the cytoplasm. This is a very important point because it, it shows that our drug will not be mutagenic in itself. Here is the uh, subcutaneous mouse model. So here you have a mouse who had 350,000 cancer cells injected. Here we're doing, we waited till the tumor grows to 5 millimeters in size. We do an intertumor injection. We allow the drug to localize in the top right hand corner for four hours. We light activate it, and you can see within 24 hours, you already have cancer necrosis, evidenced by this black spot right here. Same mouse 20 months later, no cancer, no scarring, no recurrence. In this model, we've re-injected this mouse, this poor mouse, three times, 350,000 cancer cells each time, and the cancer won't take effect, which is the immune-mediated response. Here's our orthotopic rat model. Here we've induced uh, bladder cancer inside a rat. So this is a rat's bladder. You can see that the red marks here are the actual bladder tumor, okay? And our drug is the yellow. So it's localized to only where the bladder cancer is and not on the healthy urethelium. It's also picked up micrometatastases, which are too small to be seen. 
Here it shows a full-blown, healthy, if you can use that term, bladder cancer tumor. And after our treatment, complete destruction. You're showing greater than 98% destruction of the bladder cancer tumors. So the localization of our drug um, into the bladder cancer versus the healthy urothelium is 180 times higher. So it localizes to the cancer and only destroys the cancer. So completed goals in 2015, we had a meeting with uh, pre-clinical trial application or pre-CTA with Health Canada, which concluded uh, at the end of March 2015. We've manufactured two GMP or good manufacturing practices batches of our drug, which was completed by Sigma Aldridge Fine Chemicals out of Madison, Wisconsin. So that's been completed. We've completed the toxicity analysis of the lead compound in two animal species, again showing the minimum effective dose and maximum tolerated dose of our drug. We've submitted the clinical trial application or CTA to Health Canada for approval. We've submitted the ITA or investigative testing authorization for the laser to Health Canada. And we've submitted the research ethics board or REB approval to UHN for approval. So pending goals or drivers for the stock coming into fourth quarter would be Health Canada approval of the TLC 2000 in early fourth quarter 2015, but at least in fourth quarter 2015. FDA, pre-investigational new drug application meeting. Uh, we're looking to have that at the end of fourth quarter 2015. Uh, we're looking to enroll subjects into Health Canada into a phase 1B clinical trial for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Again, pending CTA approval and ITA approval by Health Canada and REB approval by Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And we're looking for FDA and CE approval of the TLC 2000 in and around the first quarter of 2016. Again, pending FDA and CE regulatory authorities. So the last slide here is really just showing the ownership table of the officers and directors. Here it's showing that on a non-diluted basis, uh, we represent about 7.5% of the stock. Fully diluted, almost 11% of the stock. There's approximately 104 million shares outstanding, 137,000 fully diluted. So the idea is that the directors and the officers are very much tied to share performance. So that's what we're looking for. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Roger. Um, I noticed that uh, in the month of September, we've been really um, um, putting on a, a number of releases, actually, that are 11 in the month of September, according to my count. That's like 2.72 per day. Uh, on September the 1st, our stock was 27 cents. And after all this publicity and news releases, our stock managed to go, I think the last time I checked, it was 29 cents. Right. Now, how would you account for that? If the market is not responding to our uh, news releases. Well, I don't know if that's true. I think that what we saw when we released the, because we released a lot of it uh, September 8th, which was the Tuesday back after Labor Day. So I think there was four releases that week, and then there was three the next week. Uh, I saw the stock go on fairly good volume, uh, up about a penny a day. I think after that, it was up to about 36 cents. Okay, When you take a stock which is at 28 cents and it goes to 36 cents, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, it's up 30%, okay? At that level, there's always going to be profit taking. So you're always going to have people that want to trade in and out of the stock, which is why it's a public forum or why it's a, um, a public company. I think that um, based on the $8 million financing that we did in March, there's also some overhang from those shares that are out there. So it's not from the warrants, but from the stock. So you always have people who want to get in and out of stocks, there may be many reasons that they want to get in and out of stocks, but I think that what you have to look at is the fundamentals of the company. Has anything changed with the organization? Has the company advanced? And I think it's a big affirmative yes as far as where we're going. We're looking, uh, compared to where we were last year, you know, we're looking to start clinical trials for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in fourth quarter of this year. I think that's a dramatic uh, accomplishment, and I think that the stock will be rewarded when it comes. I don't think it's a short-term play. I think it's more of a long-term play. For us, it's a long-term play. But so just, to, I want to ask another question regarding the stock price. But uh, with the clinical trials, 
Uh, how many people will we be enrolling in the clinical trials? Well, that's obviously up to Health Canada and University Health Network. What will also depend on how much money we have. No, I don't. I think we're fully financed. The company's sitting just under six million dollars in cash, so it's fully funded to do the TLC two thousand rollout of our technology, both in Canada and the U.S. And it also has the ability to complete the phase one B clinical trials. So again, the numbers will depend on what the REB and Health Canada finalize. Uh, we've proposed our numbers, what we're thinking of, and typically when you're doing a phase 1 or phase 1A or phase 1B trial, you're looking at sub-30, okay, for the patient. So I don't think that's a, it's a large number. I think in our proposal we're looking at, you know, sub-15. So I think that, I think that it's a very small number because it's really the phase 1 trial is meant to show safety and tolerability of the treatment. With an endpoint, we're looking at an exploratory endpoint of efficacy. When you get to a phase 2B study, that's when you're really looking at efficacy and you're going to get to larger numbers. So again, it depends on your statistical and clinical significance. So if you have a population of people with bladder cancer, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and you do that treatment, how distinct or how uh, revolutionary is your treatment? If it's dramatic, you can get away with smaller sample sizes. If it's a very small change, that's when you have to do these large studies. So you read about pharmaceutical companies and they have to do 5,000 and 10,000 and 15,000 patients. I don't think we're anywhere close to those levels. Yes, sir. Um, uh, we talk about the burn rate all the time and uh, you've probably went through some major expenses with manufacturing the drug and then going forward with the 1B. Is there any numbers you can put to those? Or I think that um, with the two divisions, with the therapeutic division, I think that break-even is somewhere around the $3 million mark. So we're getting close, you know, as we go to the twos and threes, getting close for that division to stand on its own. The cancer division has zero revenue, so it will for the next three or four years, okay? I think that we're well capitalized in which to complete the phase 1B. Um, so I think that even at a quarter million burn a month, you still have a two-year uh, runway with the current uh, programs that we have in place. So the company doesn't need to raise capital for at least two years. And we wouldn't be looking to do that until we went to an uplist on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And I, I have another question. As being a shareholder of uh, Thoroughlays for a long time, I find it hard to believe that you're being inflammatory on the internet, uh, it's, it seems to be very constant and uh, I'm, I'm definitely pro therapies and it does bother me that you're under attack all the time. So. Well, I think in any public company or if you're talking about the bull boards, um, I think in any public forum, people are entitled to their opinion and they can be pro-company, anti-company. I think it only starts to cross the line when they start to imagine things or they make claims which are not supportable. So I think there are rules uh, to the game and I think that uh, individuals who do cross those lines are entering into some dangerous space. Any other questions? Dr. Telford. The practitioner when he is arranging an arrangement with you under which he ends up with a um, with the new 2000 series has he the option of um, no capital necessary by him absolutely he can elect to lease the product and then with the yep and with that model let's say the average price is twenty five thousand dollars uh, the lease is approximately five hundred dollars per month plus taxes you always have to give the government their cut but with that $500 per month, um, it usually starts, if they did a deal, let's say, beginning of August, it doesn't start until a month down the road. So I think that uh, they certainly have an ability to get the product in, get trained, get up to speed, get the marketing and the support, and then be subjected to a $500 per month charge. At $50 per treatment, they only need 10 patients. And most of them can treat that in a day. So the 19 out of the 20 days remaining, it's all gravy.
I think that would be very important to the practitioner and hence to, to paralyze. Absolutely. It's a very easy way to purchase the technology. Going back to that share price, you know, I am very concerned about it. And what happened is that um, I understand your explanation, Roger, but I just wondered if, if a certain segment of the market have really lost faith in Terralese or lost interest in it. You know, if you read the management in uh, M MDNA, uh, I think it was in August last year, uh, I think it was suggested that we'd have the uh, t TLC uh, uh, approved in fourth quarter of 2014. At uh, the last meeting we were at last noon, you still mentioned that we still hope to get approval uh, in, in 2014. And I think that uh, now you're saying that we're hoping to get um, uh, approval in, in the fourth quarter of this year. Mm -hmm. How, how, like, what can we say? Is that a, uh, uh, how optimistic is that and how realistic? Well, I, I think it's very, very optimistic or very realistic in the sense that when we provided the technology, we completed the technology in and around this time last year. So it was completed. It went for uh, CSA testing, which took, you know, a few months. It has been in the hands of Health Canada since February of 2015. So their guidance is two weeks to review, to screen it, and then 60 days to review it. What we have experienced is much larger and longer timelines. Uh, according to the head of the Medical Devices Bureau, they're running four to five weeks beyond their own guidelines. So they typically take about 45 days to respond. They're running more 75 to 80 days. So what happens is that they review a program and then they, after they review that program, and for us right now it's taking about two to three months. At the end of that, they, they stop the clock and they ask you a set of questions. So we respond to those questions usually within three days to a week. Once we respond to those questions, the clock starts again. Now they're typically taking 45 days, but they're taking more like 75 to 85 days. So with regulators, there's nothing you can do. So the, the company has given clear guidance on when the product would be approved based on Health Canada's estimates. We had no idea that they were running so far behind their own timelines. So we've gone through the screening process, we've gone through the review process, we are now down to the final pieces. So we're looking for approval in and around the end of October. So we're looking at the final thing. We've given them our documentation or our final documentation the first week of August. So even with their guidelines of 75 days to 85 days, that puts it at the end of October. Having said that, there's nothing that says that they can't come back with a new set of questions. Highly unlikely, but they could come back. If they do, it'll push it back into the end of December. But I think we're on track to show a nice 25 to 30 percent growth, even on our existing 1,000 technology. Once the 2,000 launches, that's when we're really going to be able to show some dramatic growth. But we're beholden to the regulators. We can't move ahead until we have their approval. So practitioners are aware that we're coming out with the TLC 2,000 soon, and they're still buying the 1,000. They are aware of the 2000 because we've, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, but we're not allowed to promote it, we're not allowed to present it, we're not allowed to really move forward on that technology. So really all we're showing is the 1000 technology at this point. Once we have approval in hand, that's when we really can turn on the jets to market it. So we really can't build it up at this point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just uh, comment on the difference between Phase 1B and Phase 2, in that you're doing Phase 1B in Canada, but if you chose to go stateside, it's a bigger market, bigger number of uh, potential participants, um, you need a larger sample size and that sort of thing. They can take the Phase 1B from Canada, apply it stateside, or they make their own decision if there's automatics. Or yeah, the way that it's set up is that phase one is traditionally safety and tolerability. Phase two is efficacy. Phase three is efficacy against a gold standard. Phase one B is a term that was coined by Dr. Jewett, and it's really safety and tolerability with an exploratory measure into efficacy. 
as we're going forward, since we've already met with Health Canada and we're allowed to meet with Health Canada without having toxicity analysis in hand, we met with them in late March, we put the program together, and now we're in the process of waiting for Health Canada and UHN approval. Once we have that, then we can get started in Canada. Right at the time that we get started in Canada, we're going to be meeting with the FDA and showing them our data. Now, based on the very small sample size that's required for Phase 1B, we'll, our idea is to perform that strictly in Canada. Okay? But once you get to a Phase 2 clinical trial, you need larger sample sizes. Therefore, you need a larger enrollment rate. So you would need multiple sites. So we're looking at multiple sites in Canada, the U.S., and possibly Europe in order to have that patient population. Sequentially, or not sequentially, simultaneously. This word, um, the word um, uh, describing 1B uh, concerning the efficacy aspect of ex the word exploratory, does this simply refer to the fact that it's three, six, or nine patients? Um, what the phase one study is, is safe, your primary outcome measure is safety and tolerable, tolerability. If, you, if it's safe and tolerable, you pass phase one. We are looking at an exploratory measure, meaning that we're still going to look at efficacy, but it's not a determining factor because it's a small sample size. If it shows efficacy, that's great. If it doesn't, it doesn't preclude the passing of a phase one B. You don't want to lock it into because you're not really at a phase two level at this point. Because you just this is the first in human trials. Does that make sense? Not entirely. I mean, the the efficacy will fall out as a ripe plum, uh, even though the 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 goal of the trial is quite simply ep um, safety and tolerability. It will be a reported measure, but it's not going to be a determining factor. It will be reported. Of course. Absolutely. Any other? So they use the word, they coin a word, exploratory. Exploratory meaning that you can use the word secondary, you can use the word, of course. Right. So if you said, for example, that you were going to do a clinical trial and you put out 10 different outcome measures, if you pass nine of them, but fail the tenth one, does your test pass or fail? Technically it failed because it didn't meet all the outcome measures. So for this you're using a primary of safety and tolerability, a secondary of efficacy. That way because you don't, you got to set dosing, you've got to look at this at a human model. Cancer is a complex disease, okay? So you really need to have that safety and tolerability nailed down before you go forward on a full, full scale efficacy. On the laser, do, have you a personal opinion on the degree to which your therapy will in time displace ultrasound and electrotherapy? Are you bullish enough to think that you'll make big inroads into those two uh, mo um, um, modes? Or, uh, modalities? Yeah. I think that ultrasound, my personal belief, is that ultrasound is not well supported in the clinical literature. So I think that it has limited application for neuromuscular skeletal conditions. I think that electrical stim, such as inferential, has its place because you can use that as a work hardening system. If you've ever seen the Dr. Hose commercial where they put the pads on it and then you have the muscle go through spasm, you can use it as a work hardening. So I don't know if you're going to displace that. But as using it as a modality for pain, absolutely. I think that TENS or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is a temporary relief of pain versus therapeutic lasers such as Theralase, which are going to be much more long-lasting in their effect. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Do you have any knowledge of the metabolism rate of the compound? How long it will take for the body to eliminate it? I do. Uh, I don't know if that has been publicly released, so I don't think I can speak to that, but I, I certainly do know that. Can you comment about the TLC and um, using it to help either bone, tendon, or 
muscle. We all think of muscle, but there's uh, rheumatoid arthritis, there's calcium related deficiencies sure. in bones, there's yeah. cracks in bones. What sorts of settings and how, how well does it work with the bone? Extremely effective. There's lots of clinical trials that support the production of osteoblasts versus osteoclasts. In bone, osteoblasts are building it, osteoclasts are destroying it. There's lots of support based on the wavelengths that we're using that they increase dramatically the amount of osteoblasts over osteoclasts for specific conditions. There's lots of support on the um, mitosis rate doubling for fibroblasts, which are the building blocks for tendon. So there's lots of clinical support for that. So this technology is used for dermal applications, it's used for muscle, it's used for joint, it's used for chondrocytes, for cartilage, can be used for fibroblasts, for tendons. The, 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 uh, the terrific um, uh, example of the use on tendon is the um, plantar, fa what is it, fa fa fasciitis? That's a little different, that's the fascia, that's a different part of the body, but... It's on, it's, it's on, the, the, it's on the tendon. Uh, that is a tear in the fascia of the foot, plantar fasciitis, the fascia which surrounds the muscle. That's the fascia. It's, it's a different structure than tendons. But in spite of my terminology being wrong, it's very effective. I know of a case where it's... Absolutely. Very effective on fascia. It's very effective on healing. What you're doing with laser technology is you're supplying an unlimited amount of energy for the body to heal itself. So if you wanted to build a building, this is my standard analogy, uh, if you wanted to make this building, for example, you'd need three things. You'd need blueprints and approvals, obviously, from the city. Two, you'd need building materials, so concrete, steel, plaster, whatever you need. Plus, you'd need labor. You'd need hired hands in order to put it all together with equipment. In healing the body, you need the same three things. You need blueprints, which are held in the DNA of every cell. You need um, supplies or materials, which are the foods that we consume, which are used for energy, glucose and the different molecules and, and uh, fuel molecules, which we absorb through different foods that we consume. And then you need labor. The laser just supplies an unlimited amount of labor because it just provides photons of light, which are able to be laborers to help repair the tissue. So it's just like having an unlimited amount of labor to make a building, you can build it much faster. So I think that wraps up my presentation. Last question. Wait, it comes with a T TLC 2000. Where are we, how far are we away from getting approval from the uh, FDA? Where, where, where? With the TLC 2000, we have submitted our application. Uh, we're just completing their screening process. And once we go through that, we go through, uh, we'll get a set of questions, which we're expecting, I would say, in the month of October. From that set of questions, we'll answer their set of questions. And then I think you're looking at about 90 days from that mark, if you answer their questions succinctly to their um, request. So if you answer their questions in October, let's say by November 1st, you have 90 days. You're looking at November, December, 1st of February approximately. If they have a new set of questions, then the process goes on. So you've got to be sure that you're answering their set of questions. If they come back and they, you're not clear, even if on one point they come back, then you have to answer that and then they start the clock again. So Health Canada is running a clock of about 75 to 85 days. FDA's clock is around 90 days on a 510K process. When you're into the PMA process, it's about 180 days clock. So they send you a set of questions, you send it back in two days, they don't hear, you don't hear from them for 90 days. 90th day, they come back to you. Okay, thank you very much.